in 1974, and the truth, although many people like to candy coat it and confuse it, is quite different. The truth is that in 1974, there was already, the, how many elements are there in hip hop? Four or five? Four? I like him. He said four or five. He's a politician. Four or five. Okay. There are actually four elements with a fifth element that overlaps. The fifth element is called wisdom, knowledge, and overstanding. That, namely, it's the cultural. But at that time when it started, there were people, there was an energy. And I saw that energy, and I was not a photographer there. Who didn't turn that phone off? There was an energy, and it didn't have a name. And the way it was created was very interesting. And nobody has ever heard or understood where that came from. I'm going to show you. By the way, I just turned 64. Hey. This general was in the Pentagon. He was reading Play Girl Boy magazine because he was freaky. He was looking at it. And he was one of the top generals. They don't do anything because the people below them send shit for them to sign, and they don't sign it or read it. They pass it to the flunky that's next to them. So they just basically sit there and draw a paycheck. But in their hearts, and the way they get into the Pentagon, which is based on the pentagram, which some of your rappers are now espousing, the satanic, and watch these young men wearing satanic shirts and revealing their true nature. This gentleman was sitting up there, and all of a sudden, his phone rang. And he's like, what the f My phone rang. The phone ain't supposed to ring. And it was the right phone. He picked it up, and there's a voice on the other side. And it said, we want you to go to war. He said, war? He said, we got wars going all over the war. I don't want to go to war. He said, well, they got oil. He said, I'm not interested. We got oil. And he pointed to different places that they had puppet dictator leaders where there was oil. But they told him, we got something else that's more valuable than oil. We got poppy fields. We got control of the heroin supply for the planet. And he said, where is that war? Where do you want the war? They said, in Vietnam. And if you go to Vietnam, and I was in the military for six years, you see Burma, Laos, Vietnam, you know, you have that whole Indochina, what they call the Golden Triangle. And it was about poppy. And it was about the cultivation of poppy. From that, you get your morphines and so on and so forth. He said, holy cow, we got oil and control of the poppies? He said, good, let's go to war. So he called the president. And in case you think Obama has any say, Somebody was recently in a meeting with him when he said he was keeping his promise to get us, the United States, out of Afghanistan in 2011 in June. And he said, I'm going to keep that pledge. And somebody in the back told him, sit down and shut the fuck up. And he looked at him, and he said, who are you talking to? He said, do you know who I am? He says, yeah, I know who you are. He said, I'm the president. He said, yeah, we've got a lot of dead presidents, too. Now sit down and shut the fuck up. And if you don't believe that happened, because I have a friend who was there, look at him before he made the, 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 the mistake of getting on videos and being interviewed. He had a glow. He looked almost like he was radiant. After that, he lost that glow, and now people don't even listen or watch him anymore. Going back to Vietnam, what happened was, and this is where hip-hop came from, follow the flow. They took our best and brightest men and women, and they went there. And the few that came back were not the same because they had been transfixed by watching people in rice patties blown up over bullshit. And so the horrors of war, and most of these kids were my age when I went in. And a lot had a choice between jail or war, which is really no choice at all if you've ever been locked up. And 
at the same time that all our best and brightest and strongest are fathers, brothers, uncles, and cousins that would teach us in an ideal situation, in any tribal situation, any type of family situation, you got to have a male. You got to have a female, and that female has got her job to do, but she can't teach you, you hardheads, how to be men. She can scold you and do, it's not the same. When a man's in the house, the bullshit stops. So all our men were gone, and the ones that came back were gone. They were gone, they were gone. They came back and they were gone. Something was taken out of us. And what happened was the kids, for the first time in the history of the United States and possibly the world, were left alone. That doesn't mean there was never wars before. The difference was now these kids had technology. They had a little turntable. They had a little cassette player. They had a little this and that, and they, they figured out how to do that shit without paying for it. How to tap in the light post and all this other crazy shit. How to steal graffiti uh, paint. <laughs> how to get, steal linoleum and, and, and dance on what they call break dancing. Popping and locking and all that other good stuff. So for the first time in history, these kids were alone, and they had no males to look to. They had no man that they could go to. Because their uncles were like, oh man, what do you want, man? Because they fuck alone. Because everybody was jonesing. Everybody was high. Or in jail, or dead, or crazy. Walking dead. It's better to be dead or alive, but when you're dead, alive, and dead, and walking dead, you're not, you know, come on. That's where hip hop came in. And it came in for the first time because they had absorbed that energy. They had felt that spirit, and it transformed them. And for the first time, hip hop took shape. And people like Bambada were in the Bronx, and Cool Herc, and all these cats. And what they did was they said, no, this is wrong, man. We're killing each other. Every time I see him, I call him a punk. And he had his clique, and I had mine. And Ben Botter was part of that shit. He was part of the black space, and he was with some real hardcore cats. The Puerto Ricans were against the blacks. The blacks were against the whites. It was chaos. And Ben Botter said, no. He said, from now on, if you want to battle me, you battle me with what you know. You want to battle me with a microphone, we'll battle. You want to battle me with turntables. You want to battle me on that damn linoleum and see who could spin better. You think you're good with graffiti? Let's see. And that's how he taught us to battle. And that's where hip hop came from. And from that it evolved. And I have the visual history because I was there and I've got books, I've got the whole shit. That's where hip hop came from. It came from that ancient vibe. And it came from brothers and sisters saying, I am not going to hurt this cat no more. I've made a vow to love this cat, respect this cat, and build. And what hip hop was, and you've got to pay attention now, because there's going to be questions later, like they tell you. You better have this, because this is one of the questions on the test. What they had from that experience, and it's the first time in American history that the so-called Americans had a voice of the voiceless. That was the only time in American history. Because you had slavery, you had the Civil War, you had all this other dumb shit that kept us divided and everything else. Guess what's happening in Egypt now? 85% of those people in Egypt are under 30 years old. And they all got Facebook and Internet and Blackberries and all kinds of, I don't know how to, you know, I don't even know how to text. 85% of the people in Egypt are under 30 years old, Libya and so on. What has that got to do with it? It has to do with the voice of the voiceless, young people being restless, young people being creative. And what happened with that, and you've got to follow me, follow the flow, is that they used that energy, and for the first time we had the most dangerous thing that you can give a person. We had a voice, and we had an identity. And that brother who doesn't look like me, and that brother who, who doesn't look like me, and that sister, we had an identity. 
I could go to Brazil and the cat don't understand no, no English and I don't speak Portuguese. And I look at him, I say, hip hop, and he embraces me. I go to Europe, them people don't know me. I can't speak French and German and Etruscan and all that, Lithuanian, but I say hip hop and all of a sudden I got family. But what have we done with hip hop? How many of you are Christians in here? Anybody? Let me see your hands. Don't be, don't be shy. Okay. What does it say in Genesis? The very first thing in Genesis, somebody. In the beginning was, follow me, in the beginning was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. I'm going to say that again. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And out of the darkness came light, and they created night and day. Word! And guess who got the Word? The hip-hoppers had the Word. And the hip-hoppers lost the Word because they bowed down to money and corporations and people who swore in gold. It was to keep us deaf, dumb, and blind, and stupid. And where's the brother over there? He was talking about, he kept making uh, remarks about Walker Flocker. What he was really saying was how the music, the art form, had been prostituted to the point where somebody like Walker Flocker or, you know, some of these other simians can get up there and, and make money and say nothing and keep our people deaf, dumb, and blind. The record labels were scared to fucking death of me. They'd see me with one of the artists and they'd catch fright. They'd say, oh, fuck. Because nothing is better than a happy slave. In America, one of the great freedom fighters said, I freed hundreds of slaves. I could have freed thousands more if they knew they were slaves. And what you're listening to on the radio now is slave music. Who didn't turn off their phone? You're listening to slave music and slave consciousness. Now, let me tell you, as somebody who's been incarcerated, you can handcuff me, but you can't handcuff my spirit. When I was arrested, they took me in a car at night, and they take me down to Central Booking. And this big, fat, female sergeant police officer is in the car. And she turns around, the, the driver's driving, and she looks at me, you know, and she says, who are you? I said, you know my name. She said, why are you here? I said, just like everybody else, bullshit. And she started talking to me. We get about halfway to Central Booking, and she says to the driver, pull over. We get to the darkest place in the city, and she says, get out of the car. And I'm like, oh, fuck, they're going to kill me because, you know, so I couldn't say nothing. I got out. She takes the handcuffs off me. She says, go home. I've been in gang situations where people are about to kill each other, and I get up there and speak. The first year, we got the Bloods here, the Crips there. The second year, the Bloods and Crips are sitting together. When you touch people's soul, you change their entire expression. Hip-hop was that art that was given to us, and we were not worthy of that gift. And what happened as a result of losing that gift is that now you turn on the radio, you hear slave music. Go ahead, somebody. I got to do it? OK. This is graffiti in the Bronx. Keep going. OK, that's at the Graffiti Hall of Fame. That's in 1983. <laughs> I don't know. No, you just go step by step. OK, that, back up. You're going too fast, homie. <laughs> My photographs of different pieces, because back then you had to put a cartoon character any time you put a name. Back at the time that hip hop started, go for it, one. We, uh, there were two other forms. This is in Brazil. And 
and this is in the Bronx. 